I'm going to give a general overview of uh, machine learning data science in uh, financial services. My background actually was in finance. I was a executive director of Morgan Stanley, where I also served on um, the board of two of their entities. And I've studied a lot in finance. I've also done a master's with research in AI, machine learning, deep learning. So uh, it's an area that I'm very familiar with. So I, th I'm, I think many of you uh, come from a technical background, so you'll already know differences between machine learning, deep learning, AI, et cetera. So I'll skip over this. You'll also know the timelines when these things have been happening. The only thing I think that's of note, and we'll go into that in a moment, or, is the rise of edge computing and how decentralized data as 5G scales in a way that's going to impact banking going forwards. Homage to uh, you guys in Toronto, in, in Montreal, et cetera, Canada, when you're rolling AI and deep learning. The thing I would note, though, for all the, the uh, great work that Yoshi Vanjie, Jeff Hinton, and Jan McKen have done, and of course, um, uh, Alex with AlexNet, Alex Kravinsky, is that ultimately uh, these techniques have really been used in marketing heavily. And marketing is a key, key area because social media and indeed um, uh, e-commerce has been a key area for the growth of um, uh, data science and machine learning. So the key thing is whenever we, we use the internet or, or mobile, et cetera, and social media, we, we leave a digital footprint. And as Adam pointed out earlier, this event's digital, and it's increasingly a digital world. The COVID-19 crisis and tragedy has accelerated digital transformation and banking and financial services in general is no, um, you know, no exception to that. So far, of course, this uh, infographic here shows how data is really concentrated in the hands of the tech giants and indeed the social media giants. And it's no accident that the likes of Google and Facebook and then in China, we've got ByteDance and TikTok um, have some of the strongest um, AI teams in the world in, um, in terms of deep learning, machine learning, and data science in general. A big difference, and I think a big differentiator is in culture, because the tech giants view technology not just as a cost, but a revenue ge generator as well. And I think that's been different in banking where, you know, and I've been in uh, senior meetings in the past where we tended to view uh, tech more as just a a a, a cost and something that was an evil necessity. And I think in recent times that's having to change, especially with the emergence of fintech. We do have challenges though when we, we, we um, uh, take tech, some of the techniques, machine learning and deep learning into finance because areas such as causal reasoning, which of course uh, Yoshio Benjo is really keen on, uh, uh, for, so causal inference, right? correlation doesn't necessarily imply uh, causation are really important, or um, more so than they may be, say, in social media. And and indeed, explainability becomes key, especially when you may have a um, situation with a regulator or indeed your committee, and the bank may want to understand why certain decisions are being made by the, the um, and in particular by the algorithm. And again, in social media or in e-commerce, if you get a bad recommendation, you know, nobody loses money, uh, there's no liability claims, etc. there's no big catastrophic event, uh, it's just a bad user experience. But when we come into banking and finance and other areas like healthcare, uh, there are serious issues. So again, um, explainability can be a challenge. A key thing with finance, of course, is that the core element of, of finance is that it's about taking risk and pricing that risk appropriately. That's the job of a, a bank and a fi financial services institution. And even when you expand that to insurance as well, it's all about evaluating risk and taking pricing it appropriately. And things like credit risk, et cetera, equity market risk, they're at the heart of it. And machine learning can play a key role there in helping manage and evaluate that risk. Financial technology, um, of which the banks often group AI with, uh, is basically technology that helps automate and improve the delivery, and indeed can assist with risk management, business operations, and indeed uh, marketing for that matter. The other thing that we're gonna see more and more uh, going forwards is the rise of embedded banking and the AI uh, data science will play a key role in that going forwards because embedded banking um, is, is kind of like the rise of the invisible bank and it, uh, examples are Uber or Lyft for example where you're actually got um, financing um, is built into the service so it's a frictionless experience and that's starting to expand now in other areas including 
for example, getting uh, paying um, on your e-commerce uh, for for installments, getting uh, real-time loans offered to you, to in effect or credit extended to you by by providers. Now, this um, article from Finextra uh, from a couple of months ago showed how um, AI and financial technology is estimated to have a, a value of almost seven billion um, two years ago. So, and forecast to hit well more than triple um, across the five-year period to almost twenty-three billion dollars. So it's a very fast uh, uh, compound annual growth rate. And we can see where a lot of it's been used in reducing costs, uh, customer insights, customer experience, internal process automation, fraud detection, customer satisfaction. This is one of my infographics where I write an article on LinkedIn uh, about explaining how effectively AI, where I do, which I define in an earlier slide as covering machine learning and deep learning, um, is effectively covering every area of finance and insurance through the entire banking sector, in effect, be it automating credit uh, and risk management and retail banking side, cyber security, of course, where the velocity and volume of data um, means that machine learning plays a key role, payment by face, which is big in China, uh, fraud and, and indeed um, uh, fraud detection tools for payments, wealth technology, robo advisors, we've seen big ones in the US, for example, with SIGBIG, Betterment, et cetera. Um, achieve very high valuations, and BlackRock and JP Morgan get into that space with robo advisory techniques, where they can they can offer, in effect, passive management um, um, using exchange traded funds or replication of e uh, indexes for ETFs, and charge much lower fees than active fund managers would. Uh, so uh, effectively automating that process and making it more cost efficient for the the pension fund investor, for example. Automated trading has been mentioned already in a previous presentation with deep reinforcement learning. JP Morgan also did a similar thing with LOXM, Luxem, a few years ago using deep reinforcement learning. Uh, risk management, sentiment analysis. We'll look at some of these examples. RegTech, it may sound boring, but it's essential in banking and it plays a very big role, especially since the financial crisis. Regulation and compliance is key and it's a huge cost area. An example. Examples are, for example, onboarding customers um, with um, face detection using a convolutional neural network from deep learning, where um, you could extract someone's picture from uh, their, their driver's license or their passport. And in Europe, for example, during the strict lockdowns, there were some uh, where some branches were closed in Eastern, Central and Eastern Europe. They had to onboard customers through that route. And indeed, some of the fintechs like Revolut use that technique as well. Trade or oversight, again, using machine learning techniques for that. And insurance, which of course banks also for insurance products, automating claims processing, uh, underwriting, pricing, et cetera, are all key areas where uh, we see this growing. We're seeing, as, a, as I mentioned, the rise of the invisible bank is talked about a lot with embedded finance growing as well. And with open AI APIs coming through frictionless, the Uber example, predictive and greater personalization of services, and as we, we, we start to see 5G rolled out in the future, um, combining, with, um, combining with augmented reality and um, immersive experiences to create whole new um, ways of banking that we don't even imagine today. So we're, we're gonna go into more details on, on, on all of these examples going forwards. Um, I'm not gonna say too much on the types of machine learning because you'll, you'll already be familiar because it's a technical audience. But of course, we'll know that the majority of instances are usually supervised learning that we, we're often working with, whereby we have labeled annotated data. Um, this came from the, the folks at MathWorks or MATLAB, which gave a nice overview. I'm going to give these slides to Adam later so he can share them around. And I made this more as a resource for you to find things. Uh, so when we, one thing I'll mention very quickly, although many of you will already know, about overfitting, it sadly still happens uh, a bit too much. And I think in particular with um, a lot of the research papers that you see, including in using machine learning for finance and deep learning for finance, where I've actually gone and built some of those <laughs> GitHubs that they provided in their papers. And it looks very suspiciously like there's a lot of overfitting going on because uh, the models don't work very well um, when, when you try to reapply them on, um, on, on test data. Uh, that, that, that we put in uh, new test data. And it's not just myself, but I'm doing that with teams. So of course, there's a joke in, in, in uh, data science that uh, somebody says, I got 99% on my uh, accuracy on my uh, test data set. And the person asks, well, um, where did you get your, what did you use as your test data set? And the person replies, my training data set. 
Well, yeah, of course, no surprise you got 99% because it's meant to be unseen da data of the same type, not the actual same type, but same data. Um, very briefly, because you'll notice model parameters, model hyperparameters. Of course, as data scientists and engineers, we focus on the model hyperparameters in terms of what we can actually fine tune or change, such as um, the level, layers, number of layers in a network, uh, learning rate, et cetera, whereas model parameters are learned from the data. Um, so, so I've just skipped that, but essentially this gives an overview of the kind of models that have been used there. We've, we, we've seen machine learning for a long time in finance, things like evolutionary genetic algorithms for over a decade, which perform pretty well in, in terms of data science and, and portfolio optimization techniques, et cetera. And the older techniques like support vector machines, logistic regression, um, logistic regression, which provides some good explainability relative to other techniques, but perhaps not as good performance. And then more recently, we've seen the rise of ensemble models working with structured data, uh, uh, tabular data in the form of XGBoost and LightGBM. And often that's all you need if you're working with structured data. And you, if, if explainability is not a huge issue for you, when it is, there are techniques that we can look at, like uh, shut, shut trees, et cetera, and, and other techniques that are trying to give it a degree of ex, uh, explainability and Lyme, et cetera. But then also the rise of convolutional neural networks, which of course Canada and Toronto played a key role in along the way, and indeed um, recurrent neural networks. Although uh, for things like time series, I didn't say NLP because we're seeing the rise of transformers there um, really taking over that space. So very briefly, supervised machine learning, many of you will know, classification and regression, and um, examples that get used a lot in finance, for example, Random Forest Deloitte uh, Advisory points out some examples here from 2018, and a good example is that it limits overfitting as a pro, but a negative is that it, it, you can have a challenge on interpretability. So let's look at what Moody's actually did with, um, with um, a Random Forest. Look at the actual data here on the left and look at the, the random forest prediction on the right versus the linear model from st traditional statistics in the middle. And let's just focus on this because it gives a very good example, the difference between traditional quantitative statistics and indeed machine learning. The area is in red high risk demographics where we see a high default rate. A linear statistical model cannot fit this complex nonlinear and non-monotonic behavior. The random forest model, a widely used machine learning method, is not flexible enough to identify the hotspots because it's, it's not limited to predicting linear or continuous relationships. A machine learning model unconstrained by some of the assumptions of classical statistical models can yield much better insights than a human analyst could infer from the data. So we see things like random forest, XGBoost and like GBM, um, these ensemble models, um, which combine weak learners to pr produce a strong learner being used in uh, tasks such as credit card fraud, and indeed, loan, loan default prediction. These are just resources for you to go and look up in uh, uh, yourselves as to why they perform so well. Uh, and indeed, um, research and making things like XGBoost and other tree-based models more explainable, uh, I should say ensemble models more explainable from 2020 and 2021 using things like Lime and Shapley, which is key in finance because sometimes there are banks who'll say, if I don't get explainability from a model, then I'm actually going to have to use one of the, 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 the less optimal uh, techniques, even if it's got lower accuracy, because at least it gives me explainability. That's a battle that happens in some banks to, still today. And so, well, again, I've given this as a resource. You can see how CERN used XGBoost for the Large Hadron uh, Collider, et cetera. It's that stronger model. And again, this slide here just gives you a ranking of the, the performance of XGBoost and training time versus some of the other models. So often when you're working with structured data, XGBoost may be more than enough or like GBM for what you need. Unsupervised machine learning model, it's a very racy topic. Everybody's always talking about in research, but it doesn't get used that often. Uh, and anomaly detection and clustering are two, two good examples. And here we've got an example of using the Albi method with k-means. The steepness of the gradient tells you the, the, the gain that we get as we go to more clusters. As it de uh, the, the gradient decreases, we're getting less of a gain. And a good example that was shown here is like uh, when we're doing marketing, for example. And we have this group here, green, 
and we have four clusters and the blue here on the right, the darker blue. But look, the, the income group on this group, this is income versus uh, expenditure in a, in, a, in a retail store or for a retail group. But the lower income group accounts for some of the lowest and highest expenditure. So we really want to do a targeted marketing campaign on this group. You know, we're going to, it's not necessarily going to be optimal. And again, here on this right group, we see quite a lot of vari variance and dispersion. So when using the elbow method with k-means, which it goes and creates these clusters itself. And now here in this, this group, which has the highest expenditures, but is also from the lowest income group, we, we split them apart. So now we can do targeted marketing campaigns just in this group alone. That's just giving you an example. Genetic algorithms have been used a long time in, in data science and in, in, in finance. And um, they're, they're a neat tool. Um, more recently, a competitor to deep reinforcement learning has emerged in neuroevolution, which can sometimes get around the challenge of uh, sparse rewards. When you, with deep reinforcement learning, you have to do exploration versus exploitation. And sometimes when you have sparse rewards, that can get challenging. Our previous speaker on Borealis might have more views on that. And there is an argument by the proponents of neuroevolution techniques that in actual fact, which combines genetic algorithms or evolutionary algorithms to generate artificial neural network parameters, topology and rules, that they can get around that problem. Um, so, so I've just given some resources there. You can look at them yourselves. And again, the examples of how neuroevolution, some papers uh, that, that are being used in finance for, for certain things, um, um, such as um, uh, financial and, and indeed uh, financial distress prediction, uh, portfolio optimization with genetic algorithms. This chap did his master's paper all the way back in 07. And I just showed that as an example of how long genetic algorithms have been used in finance. They're a neat tool for things like portfolio optimization. So reinforcement learning, we've already covered, so I'm going to skip that. Um, deep learning, you probably already know a lot about, but again, um, our um, uh, back propagation, of course, is at the heart of it. This, um, when we have our target desire, uh, target output, and this iterative process adjusting the weights until we get to to, to network. Um, but the challenges here can be um, uh, explainability again and interpretability. Andrew Eng, who we all often know um, and love, of course, this slide, the guys from uh, boosting algorithms often get a bit upset about and say, well, with uh, structured data, deep learning doesn't necessarily outperform it. I'm a huge app proponent, proponent rather, of deep learning. However, um, to be fair to, to Andrew Eng, XGBoost and LightGBM came out in 2015 and 2017, uh, around the time he did this chart, or probably even before, after he did this chart. However, we can't use XGBoost or Light Gradient Boost when we come to computer vision or indeed um, uh, text analytics. And that's where we have to go to deep neural networks. And indeed, uh, you might say, well, where is text and indeed computer vision relevant to finance? Well, we've given the example in China, for example, how payment by face is really taken off. And indeed, how uh, around the world, KYC, onboarding customers um, in banking with um, um, uh, uploading a picture on your mobile, you use a convolutional neural, neural network there to recognize the person and, 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 and you know, detect if it's them for KYC. Another example with text analytics is huge chatbots, um, voice, voice to text, and indeed classification for sentiment analysis. These are all areas where we have to use deep learning. And... Uh, it has a, more and more of an impact in finance. Again, this is a classical convolutional neural network. Um, uh, um, and again, you can look at this paper to get more, more into that. The softmax layer here on the right uh, to, to, to give a probabilistic view of what, what it actually is. Um, and again, we have GANs. So somebody just asked a previous question. How, about, how, how can you sometimes create synthetic data in finance? Well, of course, with the GANs are famous for the deep fakes and you have the generator and the discriminator competing with each other. The discriminator knows what's fake, the fake and real image, are, uh, what the real image really looks like. And it keeps, the generator doesn't, and it's generating from noise, taking feedback from the discriminator. We have two CNNs here, but you can know it's also being done with two transformers now. And until the generator gets so good that it can deceive the, the discriminator network. So how's this relevant? Um, um, you know, when we've seen these, um, you know, deep fake images being produced, these are all fake people. Well, we can create synthetic data uh, with GANs uh, that we can use for modeling purposes and prediction um, uh, as examples. So I've given these papers here uh, uh, that you can go and look up and see how, they, how, how you can create that synthetic data. Recurrent neural networks with LSTMs is an example. 
uh, have been used a lot in time series prediction and the LSTM, of course, being able to get around the vanishing gradient problem being a key thing with the the, the architecture, the timestamps from the, the previous gate and the current current gate and indeed the forget gate. So you can read up more on those and, and how to get... We don't use them so much for NLP anymore with the rise of transformers, and we'll come on to that in a moment. But again, they've been used a lot in, in time series predictions because of their ability to handle non-linearity in a way that ARIMA models that in, in traditional statistics that get used a lot in banks struggle with non-linearity. And stock markets, for example, are not linear. They're, 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 they're prone to periods of um, ex explosive uh, volatility. The rise of transformers, this is where I do a lot of my work, transformers and indeed knowledge graphs uh, increasingly, um, uh, is something that has been a very exciting journey over recent years. And in particular, as we come into areas of NLP, they've really taken over for things like text summarization, summarizing documents. You know, maybe a central bank or a, a research analyst has produced a document. You can use a transformer to summarize them and, and get the salient parts. Um, we can use them for sentiment analysis, financial sentiment analysis, for example, to know what the, the trending sentiment is through re, um, financial reports and uh, reports that financial analysts are producing so that we can gauge what, whether a particular stock is sentiment or uh, stock sentiment rather is positive or negative, and indeed um, what um, economic sentiment exists out there. And for language translation, let's not forget that banks have customers who speak different languages around the world, and even in Canada, of course, they have French and English. So these are areas where uh, transformers are really taking over. Um, however, um, and provide real, real products that banks can use. However, the rise of the transformer with self-attention, uh, which has an encoder and decoder, um, and multi-headed transformer here, you, you can see the, the, the architecture. This came out from Google in 2017 in a famous paper um, known as Trun Attention is All You Need. And um, this paper will take you through uh, how the architecture was actually set up. But in 2018 in particular, Google released a model called BERT. And uh, Rani Horov in Towards Data Science gave a good explanation of BERT, which is a bi-directional transformer, which is using encoder that reads the text, input and a decoder that produces a prediction for the task. And it's considered bi-directional, although you could argue it's actually non-directional, um, uh, because it doesn't really matter whether the, uh, in, in that it can learn the context of a word on the left and the right, whereas the recurrent neural networks, such as LSTMs, the order mattered in a way, uh, or did matter. Whereas in transformer networks, including BERT, you can have, it can pick up the meaning, the key meaning, using the attention mechanism, wherever the, 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 the words are in a sentence. So that's why it's very powerful for things like sentiment analysis and detecting relationships between words. So these are examples, uh, uh, use case examples of BERT, and classifying um, um, sentences, single sentences, sentences together, creating question and answering system. And you've seen transformers being used to create debating systems. So a, a famous data set is Squad from Stanford, Stanford Question and Answering Data Set. And you can create um, transformer models that, that can do Q&A. So they are very huge. They're, these are the number of parameters, 110 million to 340 million. Um, in, in the uh, base BERT to large BERT, and then distal, distal BERT, which is a smaller BERT model, you get 5% degradation, but it is a lot quicker. Then you get GPT-3, which has been all over the news and headlines, which in actual fact has 175 billion parameters. And Jeffrey Hinton from Toronto University, of course, has made a point that if we get to 4.4 billion, um, trillion, trillion rather, sorry, parameters, <laughs> we will know the, the meaning to the universe and life, etc. Well, GPT-3 got to 175 billion parameters. It was able to write articles itself, although there was some controversy about it needing prompting uh, from editors. Uh, but it can write poetry, etc. although it doesn't really have common sense or understand causality. So that's still a challenge for it uh, in terms of um, um, you know, applications. Google went a step further and made an even more powerful uh, transformer mo model that had 1.6 trillion parameters known as switch, but they managed to get away with a lot of publicity on it. Maybe they deliberately didn't want a lot of noise around it. And that came out in January 2021. But as big as these models are and as powerful they are, ultimately, some, we need them to also work uh, closer to on, on mobile, for example, as things go more and more towards uh, faster interactions with the user. 
So we're, we're getting techniques like quantization that will come onto that can make them a lot smaller. Transformers are moving beyond NLP and are starting to come into computer vision. For example, Google announced in October 2020 an image is worth 16 by 16 words with no convolutions, where transformers for image recognition at scale manage to compete or even match uh, the best in class in convolutional neural networks. They're also coming into time series forecasting, for example, temporal fusion transformers, again from Google in September 2020, which also provided model interpretability um, and could um, outperform uh, the, the other uh, time series uh, methods out there. So a lot of innovation and research is going into this space. There's a lot of excitement. The big benefit of transformers over relative to, say, uh, LSTMs and recurrent neural networks is uh, transfer learning. And of course, we saw an explosion in convolutional neural networks, in part because of their ability, the ability to use transfer learning. So with transfer learning, of course, we, we, we can chop off the head. And what the engineer does, we, 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 we freeze the first layers of a, a, a pre-trained network, could be something like Inception V3, a huge network. And then we, we, we basically um, keep those layers frozen. And these are the layers that detect general features that come into, across all the domains. And then we fine tune the deeper layers to fine tune them with our own examples and add new layers to classify new categories into the training data set. Well, not only can we do that with CNNs, and that's really made CNNs much more usable, but we can do that with transformers as well in NLP. And that means that we can use them much more flexibly for NLP with fine tuning tasks through things like Hugging Face Library on, on GitHub in a way that we couldn't with LSTMs um, in, in the same way. So that's leading to a big explosion in transformers as CNNs went through that that big explosion in the last decade. I'll say a little bit about knowledge graphs um, as well, because knowledge graphs is another area that I work with. I've mentioned about explainability and model interpretability. Well, knowledge graphs are an area in data science that is growing in popularity with the big um, institutions, big banks, as well as the big tech majors. The likes of Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon have invested many, many millions into creating their own uh, knowledge graphs. And indeed, Google search is a, a giant knowledge graph with machine learning techniques on top. Netflix, for example, movie recommendations also uses knowledge graphs. And increasingly, banks are looking at applying knowledge graphs to um, solve um, challenges in things like fraud detection, financial crime analytics, and indeed create recommender systems and conversational AI models. With knowledge graphs, we have um, entities. Think of them as nouns or objects. We have edges, which are the relationships. And then when we have two, two entities with a relationship between them, we call it a triple. And we, we have the ability to, we go through a process of basically uh, segmenting a sentence, tokenizing it, and then um, um, recognizing the entities called NER, or named entity recognition, the relation extraction, and link those entities as unique entities. So here we have a, a visual example where, you know, images are always better. So we have node A, node B, and the relationships in the middle. So the example that uh, analytics video gave was President Putin of Russia, he worked, he's the president of Russia. He works, he used to work at the KGB or work for the KGB. And Russia is also a member, member of APEC. So you can see how you can get these direct relationships and then secondary relationships being formed. So this is actually a triple. Putin, Russia, president of, president of is a relation. This is a more complex example of full, full, um, a fuller uh, uh, knowledge graph that's being uh, uh, created. And you can see the different relationships but then you can see you can visualize it very quickly. And it has the advantage of speed as well. When we, we store them in a graph database, be it Tiger, Tiger Graph or indeed um, Neo4j, they can query these things a lot faster than, uh, in terms of when we, we're looking at relations than say even a NoSQL database can, which works on indexing. So um, you, get, you start to get more model explainability when we combine machine learning with knowledge graphs, because you can visualize it in a way and understand what's going on but also get faster queries. So here's an example of, uh, from Tiger Graph where a company was um, uh, using um, um, a knowledge graph that's stored in Tiger Graph to assess uh, uh, credit risk and provide financing and, and loan facilities, if you like, extend financing to somebody who was not bankable because they were subprime. And we could map out um, you know, what their loans were and um, what, what their um, uh, challenges that they had, if you like, as relations. Um, Again, in Neo4j, which is a, a, a graph database where we can store knowledge graphs in, you can see here an example that they provided a financial risk reporting. And you have the entities and the relations and 
you can you can then uh, query it accordingly. But also you can eyeball it and understand what's going on as a human. Neo4j using financial, uh, showing the example of financial fraud pre prevention, again as a, a graph and the ability to, to see what's going on, the, the entities, the relations, et cetera. And then um, we, we, we don't get to the ability both with, of combining them with things like transformers and indeed graph neural networks, GNNs, to, to provide very powerful analytics to, to classify what's going on and classify relations, uh, create um, solutions for missing edges and complete graphs. So they get, get, they're getting used, uh, for example, for stock market predictions with rolling windows, financial risk analysis for small and medium-sized enterprises using graph neural networks, and fraud detection with camouflaged fraudsters, uh, loan default analysis. The points that I made before, which is about finance is all about risk and managing risk. I know I'm talking a bit fast, sorry, I had a lot to cover. So I've been a bit ambitious and tried to cover a lot of areas, so forgive my speed. The other challenge there, as we pointed out, is we're getting to as bigger and bigger giant models, as you saw with Switch and GPT-3, et cetera. But then equally, as we're getting to a situation with, uh, and especially as 5G will take off going forward in the future, where we need to work more and more on the edge rather than just um, on the cloud, where we might be doing real-time analytics. And like we were talking about frictionless embedded banking, um, where, where somebody might be in a whether it's an Uber or Lyft or doing things through their mobile. And, you know, you don't want all the latency and all the traffic going back and forth. Well, um, MIT C-Cell showed in the luxury ticket hypothesis how you could prune or quantize a neural compression, um, um, large networks or deep neural networks to make them smaller. And that's something that we're going to see more and more going forwards as a, a key technology. And you can actually prune uh, transformers. So there are tools out there that allow you to make tr transformers um, after you train them uh, much smaller and w more workable. Another area that's uh, growing, gonna grow very uh, rapidly, in my opinion, is federated learning with differential privacy. One of the big challenges we have for machine learning in banking is data. Data is often siloed. It can be decentralized um, and you have a lot of privacy uh, uh, protection. In Europe and the US, uh, sorry, in Europe and uh, the UK, we have uh, GDPR. The UK now has its own version of GDPR after Brexit. And of course, in, in Canada and the United States, there's also various data privacy regulations. Banks take these very seriously. But of course, without data, you can't scale and grow your machine learning or deep learning models. So it's a challenge. And what federated learning does with differential privacy is that it allows us to create collaborative learning where, say, time t0, or, uh, we, we start with uh, the model in the cloud like we do today, and then t, t plus one, we start training it. We, we, we then um, distribute it to decentralized servers. Now, these could be mobile devices with GPUs on them. For example, it's forecast that by 2023, there'll be about 2 billion mobile, mobile phones with AI chips or GPUs embedded on them. And then they can learn locally and then, uh, and then update um, tr uh, to the centralized model, but they don't remove the data. The data stays where it is. Crucially, they update, remember when we looked at parameters before and hyperparameters, they update the parameters of the model, the mathematics of the model, if you like, the weights and the gradients. So the data stays where it is, but we get collaborative learning. And this is going to be a key thing for, uh, in areas like banking and healthcare, where data privacy is a big block right now on, at times scaling machine learning. And we want to get into hyper-personalization at a client level. So federated learning, here's an example that NVIDIA showed with healthcare, but you can see this extending to banking in a similar way because banking has the same barriers with, 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 with uh, data privacy. So they have a federated server, they have different hospitals, a, a medical cent research medical center, community hospital, and a cancer treatment center. And you have local data, uh, private data that stays locally, but then updates the parameters of the model with, and then it gets updated globally uh, to everyone. So you get basically collaborative learning. So again, this just shows how we're gonna scale this going forwards in the future, because it's estimated by, by 2022, there'll be 1.25 billion phones with, with AI chips or GPUs on them. And then with federated learning, we'll have re less reduced label data, faster training, and local deployment with more personalization. So this is gonna be a big game changer to scaling machine learning across banking and indeed insurance in the future. A key point I want to make out though, is that when we get into the hype of AI, which I do myself as well, 
we forget that it's still a relatively small market, even though these techniques have been around for a while. And it's set for very rapid growth in particular from 2022 to 2025. And I think that's going to coincide with the, the uh, growth of things like federated learning and uh, indeed uh, 5G scaling. Why is 5G relevant? Because um, it's been delayed with all the issues that have been going on with Huawei in China and the geopolitics and um, uh, basically seeking to, to build our own networks ourselves. However, it gets to very low latency, not just very fast speed. And that's going to enable a uh, huge scale of the IoT, Internet of Things. So when we're getting into this world of, um, of um, you know, decentralized data and doing things on the edge and frictionless embedded banking um, on devices all around us and sensors, et cetera, um, we don't want a huge amount of traffic going back and forth on, and, and lots of latency. We want real-time analytics. 5G is going to be massively faster than 4G, um, but with very low latency relative to, to 4G. And it's going to enable techniques like augmented reality and virtual reality that currently struggle with latency to work and also exponentially more devices per square unit of measurement to connect a lot more than say you can do with 4G right now. So you're going to get a lot more capacity for IoT and sensors. And that's going to affect things like real-time credit analytics, for example. You can actually start doing with manufacturing sectors starting to understand or transportation etc what's really going on what their credit rating really should be real time etc so you know we're going to have, um, go from a situation where we've got thousands of cloud servers to billions of device the edge and we'll need machine learning to make that work um, and have near instant responses across lots and lots of devices and that's why we're going to need techniques like federated learning and lots of edge computing uh, for that and again, when you're going to get to these techniques from, and I think from 2022 to 2025, when 5G really starts to scale, and you could have augmented reality or mixed reality with uh, glasses, for example, and we'll be seeing each other as um, three, 3D holograms. And you could be doing your banking in ways that you can't even imagine right now, completely frictionless on your payments, et cetera. So we're going to see this huge increase in connected devices. Statistics is 75 billion. I'd just say about 40 to 50 billion by 2025. But with this huge amount of data that's going to get generated, 175 billion zettabytes, there isn't going to be another uh, AI winter, as some say, because we can't make sense of that data without machine learning and deep learning. And the market opportunity from 5G is huge. For example, in the media sector, they say $1.3 trillion of revenue by 2028. And again, this trajectory, which overlaps with um, um, the growth of AI, if you like, 2022 to 2025 that we saw earlier from KPMG. Because if you think about it, when 4G came, it enabled the explosion of um, um, mobile, uh, um, smart mobile applications like uh, social media and e-commerce, which in turn led to more and more powerful deep learning as that data grew. With 5G, it's going to be even more rapid and even more powerful, but more, in my opinion, disaggregate, decentralized data, which is why we're going to need techniques like federated learning, which will be great for banking services because we could then start to also get around the, the privacy issues over time um, by, with federated learning and differential privacy. But this um, image from, it's a video actually from, from Microsoft showing the HoloLens where this hologram gets created and uh, she speaks in Japanese, even though the speaker doesn't speak Japanese. So you think of the COVID crisis right now and how we're doing everything from Zoom. I'm here in London and you guys are kindly hosting me in Canada. Now, maybe some of you might be French speakers and I could be speaking to you as a 3D hologram in French with my voice. And um, you'd be seeing me, as I say, in, in, in 3D rather than 2D. That's the world we're actually going to over the next few years. The new products that are going to come out of this are endless. We can't even imagine them. Uh, it's going to be a whole new customer experiences. We'll be doing our banking, interaction with financial markets, et cetera, real time uh, in terms of what's in front of us. So it's, this is my own, um, this is an image I actually created showing a person watching, sorry, uh, you know, Justin Bieber, no, not, not everybody likes him, but he's a Canadian icon in, in the US. And you can see this person interacting with them through augmented reality or mixed reality glasses, and then even purchasing the and making a payment of the t-shirt. That's just one example of the kind of things that we're going to be going into. And we're going to need machine learning for that, deep learning, you know, um, computer vision combined with um, uh, analytics to make hyper-personalization at scale. So basically, in summary, 
uh, with a machine learning model, no matter how complex, whether it's deep, deep learning or other techniques, it's all, always the data really matters. And sufficient quality of data and quantity of data are really, really important. Without that, we can't get there. And that has been a challenge sometimes in banking. I'm working on applications on my own with my team, and we're having to actually create our own data sets, scraping them and labeling them, annotating them. The, uh, it's a time-consuming process, but that's sometimes what we have to do to make our deep learning models work, because um, sometimes the, 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 the available data just isn't quite good enough. We've also seen a situation where many banks around the world actually still operating in systems like COBOL on their infrastructure from the 80s and 90s, and are not willing to invest in um, mo modern architecture. To be fair to the likes of RBC and Toronto Dominion in Canada, if I recall correctly, they have actually made that transition to move away from COBOL, which means uh, they can really engage with data science and AI much more appropriately than some of the other banks can in, say, Europe or the US, who's still stuck in those very ancient legacy systems. And if that is the case, then organizational culture that views technology and data, if you like, as a cost base rather than a market opportunity is one, going to be a key differentiator between the emergence of fintech um, startups, which are going to eat more and more into banks using machine learning, deep learning techniques, et cetera, and also those banks that are able to adapt, like JP Morgan and perhaps a couple of the Canadian banks, to the emerging data science techniques by investing in infrastructure and making sure they've got the right data science talent to, to, to move forwards. The other thing that a reason why many machine learning projects fail, according to Gartner, between 87 to 92%, depending on who you believe, is that the wrong problem is chosen. And often the data science team don't talk the same language as a business team. The business team think that machine learning or AI is some magic. It's like Skynet, it's gonna do everything and solve all their problems like a silver bullet. And the data science team don't really know what the business team actually want. And they end up spending a year building something that doesn't actually do anything that it was meant to do. So I think these are all some of the key challenges that we need to ensure we solve for. And indeed, making sure we've got proper diversity in the team, because only then can we ensure we, we avoid some of the pitfalls that we see with uh, bias, et cetera. So racial diversity, gender diversity, uh, having different levels of talent out there can make sure we avoid things like Tay the chatbot. So this has been a very generic presentation because I've tried to cover end to end, if you like, of all, all the different things that are going on there from uh, uh, across financial services, all the way from um, federated learning, graph neural networks, um, knowledge graphs, um, transformer models, going back to this slide, sorry, jumping all the way back, which covered um, basically product development um, in this infographic. You know, the whole sector is gonna be transformed by machine learning um, over the next few years. Every product in uh, banking, be it investment banking, retail banking, or insurance, and indeed back office operations like regu regulatory technology, wealth technology, and investment management, every single area is gonna become dependent upon using machine learning and deep learning going forwards. So it is a very good sector to get into. It does have challenges, as mentioned, because sometimes uh, management teams want explainability, and we have to think how we can get that with some of the models, with some of the techniques that are out there. Um, transformers, you can use visualization of the attention mechanism, and there are also other tools that are being built that go beyond visualization to provide that. And uh, things like XGBoost, as mentioned, the things like Lime, and indeed, um, uh, uh, Shapley, etc. So we're, we're going to go more, and indeed knowledge graphs, combining knowledge graphs with machine learning is going to be able to provide for that. So I think I'm going to stop here because I've, I've talked at length. So I've tried to cover a lot there. I know it's a lot of information that's been thrown out there, but I wanted to give an overview, show how the entire banking sector has been transformed. How do you handle bias in the data and its impact on AI models and consequently decision making? Yeah, no, that's a great question. It's very topical, isn't it? Because uh, um, and uh, I think one of the points is diversity in your team. And we've seen that with, um, there was a situation where, um, I forget whether it was Microsoft or Google, with their computer vision and their face detection. And again, that, you know, we, we use face detection in banking, whether it's payment by face or more often in, in, in the West, um, uh, in, in Canada and the US and Europe for um, 
onboarding clients for KYC, for example. And it, unfortunately, the data set, the data set forgot to, to train it on or had insufficient samples, I should say, uh, of people uh, from Africa and indeed Asia. And so people of color, myself, of which, you know, like myself and others, and people from, so be it from Asia or Africa, were being classified as gorillas. <laughs> That's horrendous, right? It's terrible uh, because there were only white male faces and, 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 and women were, uh, they were also struggling with women because they, they had mostly male white faces. So if you have diversity in your data science team, somebody would actually point out a woman or a person, a, a, an Asian person or a person from Afri of African origin may well say, um, hey, <laughs> hey guys, you got something very basic wrong here. So that's one, one, one thing is your personnel. The other thing is um, also in your data itself, because uh, in, in the sense that we, some of the recent studies are shown very well um, known data sets out there on closer examination, I'll, I'll send a report to Adam so he can distribute it, uh, like c 10 et cetera, and some others, actually had significant errors in the label data sets and the actual label data sets, which would mean that all the models that you were training on them probably also picked up on those errors. So we get biases from uh, in the data, uh, subconscious biases as well sometimes uh, on the way that data has been set up. That can also get reflected by the composition of our team. So I think having diversity in the team and having people who can sense check and, and double check that we may sometimes have to use other techniques like data augmentation or, um, you know, to, to, to make the data more representative. Uh, it, it's a very topical subject. Which type of ML models do you expect to see in the future in finance to make predictions on customer data except for computer vision and NLP applications? Yes, yeah, so I think uh, with federated learning, you can use different algorithms. XGBoost gets uh, has been experimented a lot in federated learning, uh, and and uh, as well as some of the deep neural networks. So I think more and more we're going to um, get to see a growth in using the techniques of federated learning, be it using XGBoost or other techniques in there, so that we can get this collaborative learning and learn through decentralized data, because that is the big challenge, to, one, of the, one of the big challenges to scaling machine learning, whereby banks will say, hey, you know, <laughs> my data is very private and my customers are very private and I don't want to co collaborate with anyone on that. But at the same time, you, you know, they're not really sure sometimes how to access the data and develop models on it themselves. So that's going to be a key, key point to, to scaling, scaling that up there.